So let me get started. Uh, as I said, I'm Judicial Eddie. I've got Hugh as well on the call. Hugh is the CEO and founding partner for Dixio. Myself, I, I currently manage the Traversal business and MT for Traversal Solutions. Um, I want to just first of all start very briefly before I get into uh, some of this conversation is that we uh, as, a, as a team, Dixio and Traversal are looking really to effectively deliver more effective solutions around fraud, um, AML and fraud, and, and primarily around financial crimes which covers quite a wide range of uh, topics, including, uh, you know, uh, of course, um, social transaction management, um, AML, CFT, ABC. There's quite a few other uh, financial crimes that are launched under that compliance agenda. Um, from my own experience, I have, uh, well, over 25 years experience in technology. Um, in 2004, I was exposed to a solution, an enterprise scale solution for fraud after my first foray into an effective fraud solution. And since then, and more recently in Nigeria, we've been helping clients to effectively deliver effective fraud um, AML solutions in the banking sector. Uh, Hugh, and you can add one or two things to that. Hugh, can you quickly introduce yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, yes. Uh, so, good morning, thank you. Uh, so well, my name is Rui Vicente. I'm the CEO and uh, founding partner of Dixier. Um, I've been working uh, with compliance for the last uh, 15 years at least, um, starting in, in the Portuguese government, um, helping the Portuguese government in fighting financial crime, and then uh, in some consulting companies, and then founding my own company. Uh, where we develop uh, uh, our services and develop uh, um, a system for helping banks and financial entities to, to monitor and fight uh, uh, AML and terrorism financing uh, among fraud, of course, and uh, um, other, other, other financial crime issues like third party and things like that, bribery and so on. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to be present here today uh, with uh, Jaid. Um, I hope that uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, interesting for you, that some questions arise at the end or in the middle as you wish, and that we can enlighten uh, a little bit uh, how do we see this question of AML and frauds and how it can be uh, managed inside of the financial institutions. Jaid, back to Now, I, I want to start by not necessarily describing, uh, you know, I want to give some insight into some of my own experience around uh, fraud. Um, but then I'll come to the topics that we want to cover as much as possible. I, I'm sure some people around this webinar are familiar with BCCI, which was a bank that failed in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, that bank failed catastrophically for a number of reasons. That was one of the very early um, experience of fraud in Nigeria, and not just Nigeria, but to the global bank at that time. Um, and, and even though at that time, uh, the technology is not as advanced, we're talking about 1990, 1991, when it failed, uh, the impact in the market was a very, uh, very major issue at that time. So at that time, the PCPI over a million depositors, small depositors lost money uh, with, uh, with the bank. Um, and of course, the bank, the PCPI was a bank that actually had a lot of inroads into central banks, um, and they did deposit money with the bank at the time. Over $20 million was lost at the time. And, and, and some other facilities, actually government entities also did lose money with the bank. And, and overall, the loans at which they had uh, were given out to, to governments and, and government banks and were actually significantly higher. So a billion dollars was lost. And this was in 1990. Um, fast track now to today, two days or three days ago, Commerce Bank was in the UK was fined. Thirty million dollars for effectively money uh, for for, for anti-money loaning um, non-compliance. Basically, BCCI, as I said earlier on, has been uh, in, uh, one of the early banks that failed in 1991. Um, with those significant losses for customers, over a million customers deposited money with the bank and lost their money at the time, and up to up to a billion dollars uh, was was lost in government loans. Um, okay, so. I want to kind of go through and, and so the, is there is there any background noise just to be sure because I heard a bit of background noise, but it's fine now, I think. So at the time this is yeah, was a was one of those banks that failed significantly. Um, and more recently, as I said earlier on, that uh, Commerce Bank in the UK over three days ago failed. Um, well, was fined over three thirty million uh, US, uh, pounds 
for non-compliance uh, with, with uh, financial regulations. So I want to now basically describe what we're going to be trying to cover. Um, but I think it's also important to, to, to mention that uh, even though the, the, the earlier incidents of banks failing on, on related to fraud uh, were, were very much, you know, it's over 30 years ago, we've had one or two incidents in that time. But it's at that time, even till to now, we, we still have a lot of collusion um, as part of the problems we have in fraud, um, in, in banking especially. But I'll talk to you, I'll talk about, I'll describe some other scenarios around this later. So I want to cover as much as possible very quickly um, with you, uh these six topics. I would like to kind of, first of all, describe what are the fraud banking statistics that are out there. It is a global fraud statistics that we know, as well as what's going on in fraud. And then I will describe um, how mechanisms in place. Um, but first of all, I'll address the challenges uh, achieving compliance. So what are banks doing? What are the challenges they're facing and doing that? And what capabilities does a bank need um, around uh, financial crime. So what it means does it need to have in place? And then how do we effectively build the right set of fraud rules and scenarios to, to, add, to address those uh, fraud, fraud instances that they have? Um, I would then effectively hand over to review theory on, on doing this right from a big picture way. So he will be effectively describing how this uh, uh, digital solution, DCS, effectively delivers a fraud, a better fraud outcomes or uh, fraud, fraud detection outcomes. And then we would open up the question and answers for these last questions. So um, I want to quickly move on. Uh, so firstly, uh, statistically, uh, to the right hand side of the screen, what you're looking at are global figures. Now, if we're to be, most of these, most of these factors that we're seeing, the statistical factors that we're seeing are historically been going up and it still continues to go. So we know that uh, for fraud in general, that uh, most, that's probably perpetrated by all kinds of means, but one of the key means that happens is the victims of fraud accounts uh, duplicated and their accounts are opened in their names. Over 1.5 million of that um, has been opened last year in loan. Um, and that's resulted to over 200% increase in fraud based on that model. So there are different models, doing threat models in, 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 in fraud, but this one has grown 200% in one year. So you can see that that's still an issue. Now, we also know that when do fraud does occur, the banks are typically not able to respond um, effectively in terms of uh, recovering the monies that's lost on that. So it was about 20, less than 25 percent really is the recovery rate so far on fraud. So when does fraud of course, these losses are significant and the recovery is nearly impossible to, 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 gain, to gain back. Um, with new technology where we have money service, we're leveraging digital economy, um, the cryptocurrency as well. Now we're now finding that banks that have those inroads into those kind of capabilities are, are being challenged by fraud. So 48 percent is the figure we have for that. Now, if you add all three things together, but and with so many other processes out there, you would see that reputation is always a stake for banks, um, and, and also the integrity as a, as a service. And of course, when this fraud of course, the cost of doing business goes up um, for the bank. And, it, and of course, and then from a banking operation point of view, uh, banks are having now to focus more on how to prevent those kind of fraud, rather than focusing on strategic intentions. So it's not good. Uh, statistics still, there is a long way to go around tackling and entering fraud. Um, and there's a need for, for change with the banking sector. Now, banks are not actually uh, ideal on, on this issue. The banks have recognized the fact that they need to do more. Um, we know that in general that oh, this is a global figure, so these figures could be different from your region. The banks are looking to effectively build integrated reporting in, within their solution. Their the, the upper, the upper percentage is high now. Re there's a recognition that for financial crimes, tackling financial crimes, there is a need to have integrated reporting. There also, there's a, there's a drive to be, have a better governance across the, the fraud risks um, scenarios and, 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 and landscape they see. And of course, they're looking to integrate their systems better because with the integrated systems, uh, the kind of fraud rules you can build on top of your infrastructure is better. Um, I think also that with, with banks, there's a, there's a general recognition to, you know, to the left-hand area that the fraud and fraud financial crimes functions need to be merged more cohesively so that um, the the kind of checks, the kind of validation, the kind of alerts um, cover the, the, the entire um, fraud landscape. There is also the, a recognition that there's a need to integrate teams and processes, and that's also going on in the banking sector. Um, but one thing also that's very important is banks are looking to reduce their costs. So as much as possible, these statistics uh, effectively dip, uh, dip, recognize the fact that banks are doing the right thing, um, and they, are, they understand the way forward, and they've been making, they're making the inroads necessary to make sure that um, fraud incidents are reduced in their banking operations. 
So if we look at uh, a bank as a whole, um, there are three critical areas that are challenged us. Um, as an entity, an, an enterprise as a bank really needs to be very careful around these challenges. And, and I think many banks are recognizing that they need to do something around them. And they have those they put in processes in place to address that. So there's banking evolution. Uh, the banks are recognizing that they are leveraging the digital existence now. They're looking to effectively do more business leveraging the digital platform. So there's a drive to do that. Um, evolution of fraud as well. Fraud is continuously expanding. I'll talk a bit about that later. The compliance landscape is growing. I'll describe how we, how that has been evolving in the last 10, 15 years. And then the cost of fraud um, to compliance is also an issue. From a practitioner perspective, um, the, the compliance officer are looking to effectively build better rules. Um, they want to reduce false positives and they want to create a situation whereby they effectively can uh, manage fraud and prevent fraud as much as possible. Historically, it's always been about uh, detection, but most banks are now looking at uh, pre preventive measures. So practitioners are very keen on, on making sure that that's where they get to. Um, from a silo systems point of view, from a systems perspective, banks are recognizing that silo systems will not work for them, so they're looking to integrate their systems better. Data is definitely improving, um, and they also don't understand that complex delivery is not the right way forward. So there are measures banks are looking at to, to correct some of these challenges that they face. Okay. Okay, so because banks have these challenges, um, if you look at a typical bank, uh, they, they recognize that they are looking to put in place financial crime solutions. Uh, but the challenge really is around identifying all the capabilities they need in the bank. So to the right and left on the end of the screen, you're looking at some of the capabilities that banks know by default they need to provide. So from a regulatory point of view, banks have to put in place mechanisms to, to, to identify customers better. So compliance due diligence is important. Uh, they need to identify risks clearly, um, and also be able to mitigate those risks very, very clearly. But also they need to, to share information with, uh, with, with, with other banks. But they look, they can, they're doing that typically through the financial intelligence units of, of the country in which they, they operate. So, uh, but those, but those things, issues are not necessarily solving the problem, but they, I mean, the good thing is the banks are recognizing that they need to have a, a wider landscape around tackling fraud within their operations. Um, so the right hand side, you're looking at so the, the figures around KPMG. KPMG has recognized, um, I put a paper together around first of the last year, May 2019, where they've identified the typologies of bank, uh, banking fraud that are occurring beyond the traditional banking, which includes social engineering, scams, cyber crime, and so on and so forth. Um, fraud operating model is also changing. So the lack of documented evidence around fraud is also an issue. Um, but we recognize that detection um, is not the only thing that we should be looking at. If prevention is better than detection. So I'm going to move on to what banks need to be doing going forward. So financial crimes capability is a very uh, hot topic for banks now. So they, they are looking at a range of things that they need to have in place. So looking at this diagram on the, on the right hand side, what you're looking at effectively are the things in grey are the things that banks need to have in place. Enhanced monitoring, they have to have enhanced customer due diligence. So not just doing customer due diligence, having the KYT, uh, they are now looking at sanctions screening, leveraging sanction lists. Uh, and there's a need for a, a, a regulated entity to have controls being, um, for all those things. So we must have necessary capabilities within the bank to tackle those things. And there's also a recognition that digital fraud, online payment is an issue. Um, and there's a drive to do that better, uh, to control all those things. Um, if getting it right in, involves really having a joined up enterprise fraud rules management system, and as much as possible, what we want to describe through the digital solution are those capabilities that exist within that. So enterprise fraud really should cover everything to do in the gray areas here in this diagram. We know that fraud is evolving. Uh, we know that fraud never stays stat uh, static. Um, even though compliance regimes all over the world have made a lot of inroads into advising governments and advising, sorry, advising banks and our policies and our controls and guidelines, the gray areas you see on the screen are things that banks still need to have in place. So if beyond having a, a fraud management system, there needs to be a recognition for tackling those frauds that are occurring in this new dimension that banks are moving into. So social engineering, cybercrime, cyber online, scams, 
internet fraud, internal fraud, which is a bigger part of banking fraud, still needs to be tackled holistically. So for a bank now, it's important not just to tackle those things that they are called Romania core banking transaction, but those things that are occurring as they evolve their business model. Now, as they evolve their business model, they are looking to effectively have, they need to really to have in place systems that cut across a range of capabilities that they need. Um, the people aspect of, of, of banking is, is critically important, so the compliance officers, the IT teams are very vital. But banks are recognizing as well that building effective fraud rules requires really uh, a deeper knowledge of the banking processes, systems, and of course, how their landscape of how they operate. Um, and what, one of the things we, we would like to recommend to them is really that tackling that fraud scenario really requires them to have an end-to-end -end value um, understanding around the problem, uh, especially as it as it relates to transactions as they occur and the authorization that follows after that. Um, the new banking model really needs to really have solutions that have pattern analysis in within it, um, should have behavior modeling. So whatever that solution is, should have social networking, probability modeling, machine learning as part of the, the mechanism built into tackling or actually providing the right set of fraud rules within the organization. Uh, fraud landscape is changing as I said, but if you look at social engineering, there is a lot of um, issues around phasing, um, spoofing, dating, and quite a few other solutions out there, uh, problems out there around fraud. So whatever fraud system, that, uh, fraud management system that's in place should really be extendable to cover those fraud scenarios. The same thing applies to card not present scams and cyber online. There are all kinds of scenarios going out there, which at the end of the day involves transactions occurring on banking, banking products or banking accounts. So effectively, systems that have to be in place, effective fraud and AML solutions, um, especially and the rules that are written in place should be able to cater for all those uh, different type of fraud scenarios that exist in the market. So getting it right, what does it look like? Um, just Basically, what I've been describing is, okay, first of all, what are the, for a bank to be effective in targeting, uh, addressing financial crimes, um, and also building the rules that sits on top of it. It needs to have those capabilities that I described earlier. It must have enhanced monitoring capability, enhanced customer due diligence, diligence customer due diligence in general, anti-private and corruption capabilities, uh, uh, sanction screening, fraud detection, um, last generation, and a few other things that we need to have in place. So it's a big exercise for a bank to tackle fraud because it needs to have those capabilities plus the growing threats around the digital economy or the digital fraud and online payments. So a, a, a bank that needs to have a, a system in place needs to have those capabilities as, as a starting point. They must also have joined up teams, integrated systems uh, to deliver the um, the kind of outcomes they want. So you can start to write good, good fraud rules without having the systems integrated. And of course, teams that actually do the investigation and assessments and around compliance of, um, or often inspecting fraud uh, cases need to be joined up as well. Um, going forward as well, it's important, and actually now banks are also recognizing that the days of actually writing, uh, effectively going through a very top-down approach, which is what you see at the top end here, um, as is over. They need to really be looking at how to optimize and uh, create efficiency around how they build the rules, leveraging new paradigms around um, behavior analysis, behavior modeling, risks modeling, um, and leveraging uh, machine learning. Uh, as much as possible, we want to use this uh, webinar to describe some of those things that is possible around the solution that we presented. Getting it right, um, as I said earlier on, it will require all those things in, in, in the blue and gray. So. You cannot just have a, a fraud system that doesn't uh, encompass cyber online scams, tackling uh, can, man, can not present situations, social engineering. Uh, internal fraud is still a big issue. So banks must make sure that they have the capabilities in place to address all those things. Now, getting it right, really, is about two things. Um, reducing the incidence of fraud. So detection, detecting more accurately is going to be important. Um, and reducing the false positives in the scenarios. But more importantly, banks need to begin to look at prevention mechanisms. Now, solutions that like Dick Steel, which we'll be describing very shortly, covers both scenarios where you're detecting and prevention. And, and I believe as much as possible, we will describe how some of these rules can be built or optimized to deliver the value work. So, Hugh, over to you. Thank you, Jais, for your interesting presentation uh, at the beginning. Um, now, what we, what I will try to 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 show and to talk about a little bit is uh, um, 
basically the complexities and scenarios, rules, and how can we implement a solution. And uh, um, this is what we in Dixture uh, have always in mind, is um, to develop a, a solution that could fit our customers and and one thing is for sure uh, um, and uh, the, the years of experience that i have uh, shown me that that this is purely true there are no uh, um, equal banks every single bank it's different every single bank it's its own business its own characteristics and we have to find solutions that will adapt to this case to that scenario to that reality so the the most difficult part is to, to 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 develop something that we can apply to all banks but at the end of the day we always have to to fit to that bank uh, nevertheless uh, there are some some major things that in all the cases in all the scenarios we'll have to to, to deal with and to take care when implementing an effective system we have some complexities and you can see it here on the screen so we have to, to get some external data services like watch lists, like verification of customers, other information that comes from uh, uh, central banks or FIUs or other partners that you have. You have watch lists, you have to identify PEPs and as I told you, other sources of information. It can be internal databases, it can be uh, services that you buy. For example, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering financial information coming for, for example, from uh, um, Dun & Bradstreet or coming from other company like that. Uh, and all of that is useful and it's important to use to know your customer. We have to get all this information. But when you talk about knowing your customer, this is not enough. We have to connect to the core system. It's there where all the data is belonging to your clients. We have to, if you have a CRM, we have to go to the CRM and to understand what information is there. We have probably a customer services or another onboarding solution working and we have to get there to get the data to be possible to integrate and to work in real time when a client is opening an account. It doesn't matter if it's on a branch, if it's on the website, uh, if it's on a laptop or a mobile phone, we have to be able to verify and analyze the client and measure the risk that it can bring to, to the bank. Uh, on the other side, you have to unify the risk. You, Jai talked about frauds. You have risk dashboards, you have uh, um, the, the AML risk, uh, but you have to more, much more information. So for, for you to have a customer risk profile, you know you need the, your know your customer, you know the diligence, the relationship and the risk score, the expected behavior of that client. And there are no thing like equal clients. Okay? When they are, something, something strange is, is going on. On the other side, you have also to do a transaction monitoring. You have to be, to be able to check all the transactions that goes on your system. And it should be every time that's possible in real time. You should be able to analyze and prevent uh, transactions that are suspicious or can raise some suspicious to go forward. Because if they go, if they are made, it's your bank that will be in, in, in question. Why did, 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 did you didn't stop it? Why didn't you analyze it? Why didn't you request for more information? And that it's equal for AML, for ter financing terrorism or for frauds. Or if we are talking about payment systems, the same thing. So the question is to integrate all this information in, in, in one application where the users can can work in a, in a, in a easy way. Uh, um, as you can see, this, this graphic uh, uh, that I'm showing here, it was designed by the Central European Bank. Uh, it was an analysis from the Central European Bank. So uh, um, a communica two-way communication with the core banking systems, it's always uh, fundamental to, to be successful in an implementation of a system. Let me, let me tell you, and picking up a little bit on what Jai was saying, that until now, I, 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 I was saying some, some years ago, but I, I, Still now, still now, the, the, the one situation can happen and uh, arises and, and gives some problems to, to the organization. Uh, let's imagine that one alert is generated uh, um, and the alert is generated, for example, in some uh, um, AML system that is working uh, on, on the bank. Uh, but even if it's an AML, uh, an AML alert, a transaction alert, uh, it can be fraud. 
well, but if it's fraud, it's not treated by the same team. So you have to pick up on that alert, close it like an AML alert. It was not AML and send it to the team from fraud. The same thing can happen when you have a fraud alert. It can be internal fraud or external fraud. It doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, it can be possibly it's not fraud. It's a, a question of trying to, 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 to do an action of money laundering. And the same thing you have to send it from one system to the other system. Basically, that's the problem with the silos uh, applications and every, everything silos. Uh, um, so it's important to, that all the information is together because only with all this information, all with these alerts, we can have a, a better comprehension, a, a more deep comprehension of, of the client behaviors, what's, uh, what, what the bank is being used for and generate better alerts with false positives. Of course, that you will have separated teams working with uh, AML and another one working with fraud, because uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, internal audits, it's different, it's different information that has to be taken, taken care in different ways. But behind that, it's important that the system has access to all this information to, to give better results. Um, let me try to see if I can change the slides. Okay, so uh, a clear alignment between overall helps to optimize the financial crime functionality. Why, why are we talking about financial crime? Today, uh, um, when we talk about, uh, talk about financial crime, financial crime agglomerates all these silos that, that we have been talking. It's, it's frauds, it's cyber crime, it's money laundering, it's uh, financing terrorism, it's bribery, uh, it's corruption. All of these are, are now... Uh, um, being treated as a financial crime and, and uh, in the banks uh, uh, things are changing uh, uh, and from the compliance departments inside of the compliance of course you have the legal then you have the guys for the money laundering and probably in the internal audit you'll have guys for the fraud this is changing and it's in, in and uh, uh, a financial crime uh, um, group is is being created that uh, will supervise all these all these matters. You can imagine how difficult this is to 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 to, to do uh, when we start thinking about it. Because if you go to cybercrime, for example, you'll have to have a team of IT guys that will respond to to to, to these questions of cybercrime. But in terms of general risk, it's the risk of financial crime. So it, they have to be all aligned. And basically, that's what's uh, what, what I'm showing here business operations, information technology, financial crime compliance, and the governance and risk uh, uh, should be supportive to each other, and all of them has to be aligned. If they are, if, if we cannot build this alignment and this support, the end of the day, the result will not be good. And if we have solutions that don't allow this integration, this alignment, so it will not be uh, an effective solution. Okay, when we are preparing to, to design and conduct money laundering, uh, terrorism finance risk assessments, um, an AML or a compliance professional must first understand then decide about several things. First, the definition of money laundering, terrorism financing in the relevant regulation. I'm sure that we all know the world standards coming from GAFI or from the, the Wolfsberg group, but and, and our experience, we work a lot with Africa. We, with Ixior, we work a lot with Angola, with Mozambique, with Cape Verde, with Santo Tome Prince, several countries, with different banks from different sides, from Taiwan to, to Tire 4. So uh, different realities. But we have to understand that each country has its own regulation. And it's really important that the team that's implementing a, a solution, a software solution, understands this regulation, understands the environment, the culture, and how business is done in this country. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Nigeria won't be different and that they will have their own, the, the same problems, the same situation, the, 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 the way of talking to the financial uh, investigation unit or to the central bank, it's different from Angola, but it has to be done and has to be achieved inside of this solution. So it's important also for the team to have the, the stakeholders uh, uh, to help in the definition of the risk. Uh, um, what are the risks that the bank is, is able to accept and to live with? This is the same thing with credit risk or with operational risk. We have to understand up where we want to go. It's easy to, 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 to show an example from this. For example, the decision 
uh, of uh, how much transactions in different currency in, we want to, to support. Are we able to have a bank that works 80% with uh, American dollars and only 20% on, on the, the, the currency of the country? What currencies do we allow, do we allow to, to work with? Do we want the China's currency to be more than 25%? If it's more, should we raise an alert? That's the, the kind of questions that have to be made. Do we want more cash uh, transactions or do we want more uh, um, electronic transactions? So this is the scope that we have to understand. We have to understand and define clear what the customer types, if it's an individual, a company, a government, whatever. The definition also of the products, of the regulated activity. Which products do we have? Which services do we have? How do we sell them? How do we communicate them? Because every single product, every single service, it, it has its own risk, as you know it. Any legal prohibitions or certain customers and relevant sanctions regimes shouldn't be allowed to work with us. And it's really important to have all these lines really well defined because it's not easy to explain to the boards why are we saying to, to, to that we will not accept a client that brings one million dollars okay and the, the board has to understand that not accepting this client is reducing the risk of you to be fined and to to have to enter in a reputational risk okay so this is uh, uh, crucial for the success of an implementation of a system if you cannot uh, have all these uh, first really understand, defined, and everybody believing on it, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what system you are putting there, it will not uh, match with your needs. So, the key characteristics for a money laundering, um, we have, as I said, we have to address money laundering and terrorism financing and fraud. Um, we should include an assessment uh, of our organizational weaknesses, basically understand what are the weaknesses that we have inside. Uh, we have to understand what are the risks of money laundering and financial uh, and uh, frauds and terrorism financing inside of our team with the employees of the bank. Uh, we have to have the means to measure and act on changes in the firm, um, both internally and externally. We have to review periodically uh, the, the rules uh, if, if we are managing the, these risks well. We should cover all the risk indicators. We should incorporate feedback received by regulators or guidance bodies or even the board. We have to try to be aware for current and emerging trends. Things are always changing. You know, criminals are always in front. It's like doping. Doping is always in front of, of, of the, the guys that control anti-doping, okay? So it's the same thing. We have to be aware of what's happening so that we can prepare ourselves to better defend. We should be linked to the firm's change control process. It's important that all of this uh, um, is integrated. And of course, it covers uh, the types of money risk, fraud, risk that uh, its peers in the industry, all the other banks, all the community of banks they have with their risk assessments. That's the, the reason for uh, getting help and communicate a lot with the central bank that can help us also to implement uh, better methodologies and to, 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 be, to be successful. So a successful risk assessment methodology will be the one that sets out clear how it works, it's easily updated, it leverages available and external internal information and can be explained and operated by staff in business units. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, you can buy a Ferrari, but if you don't know how to drive, the Ferrari stays stopped there. So we have to have a Ferrari that is easy to drive and that anybody can, in an easy and fast way, understand how to work with the system. So there are some challenges in implementing an effective AML solution, as I would say, but um, technology has helped us to design some solutions and to improve our work. That there were, this is where DCS comes to, to life. So I will try now to change these for, uh, um, for my, to show you a little bit of, of, the, of our solution. Give me just one second, please. If, if you still, for the moment, if you have any question, please just say it and I will try to answer it while I'm, I'm trying to change it to be shortly. This is basically our solution. Um, I will not make a, a deep demo today for you guys. I will just show you some functionalities of our, of our solution and show you how easy, how, how it's easy to, 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 to parameterize the solution. Uh, to to adapt it to each and every reality. 
basically the main dashboard gives me an idea of the work that I have. How many alerts I have to be assigned or to be closed and how many of alerts and processes do I have? I can change it from alerts to processes. Basically, the difference between alerts and processes are alerts are a, a fast way to see what is the doubt. Uh, I can close an alert in a really fast way. If I want to go deeper on an investigation, I will go to a process where I can join all the information and uh, um, make my, my complete investigation. So here we, we can see that we have alerts, processes, alerts to be assigned, inquiries is a way that I can talk to the branch in a fast way and the, all the information uh, keeps, um, it, it's saved inside of the system. So if I, for example, I want to ask for a, a, a commercial guy or a, a director um, some information about a customer and I want to request some information like passports or bills or commercial information, I can request it to, to, the, to the commercial guy and they will send it uh, with uh, answering to this information and I will receive it here. It will be uh, saved on, on our system and be attached to the, to the profile of this, of this person. We can have entities under monitoring and accounts under monitoring. So uh, basically, if we have some suspicious accounts or we want to have a deeper high, uh, look in, in a deeper way to, to some accounts, we can say that we are putting it in, in under monetization. This, once again, can be also adapted to fraud or to money laundering. It's, it's the same thing. So we have alerts. We have processes, as, as I told you. We can build manual processes, for example, uh, um, if it's something that it's not arising from the system. Uh, but let's imagine that the financial unit um, from your country asks you information asking if Rui Vicente is your client. This is some information that we still, we should save it and put it in our historical data because Rui Vicente today it's not your client, but tomorrow we can try to open an account and it's important to know that you have a court or some authorities asking for, for this Rui Vicente, okay? So you can create manual processes. You can see uh, all the information about entities, accounts. You can do manual filtering. Um, you can do inquiries. You have a branch of reports about entities, accounts, exemptions, transactions, alerts, processes uh, that can be built. Um, we still have statistics about alerts and processes. This is just an example uh, of the alerts. So basically having all the information uh, gathered in one place. Um, where we can see it by uh, totals, uh, diligences, uh, know your customer, know your transaction. We can see how they have been the, the nature, um, the origin, um, and we have all the historical data here. We can see it uh, by decision, by users, uh, by time. Well, it's, it's a, a lot of information that we can have in a, in a very fast way. We have the FIU reports, of course. Uh, um, it depends from country to country, but for example, in Angola, you have to send every single day um, how many cash transactions were made the day before. Uh, this is an automated report that has to be delivered to the financial uh, institution uh, authority in, in, in Angola. I don't know if you in Nigeria or in the other countries where you belong from, if you have this kind of reportings. Then you have the settings where you can, you can uh, change uh, um, all the information in a very easy way. I will just show you an alert. I will try to show you an alert so that you can have uh, an idea. I will show you an alert uh, from a transaction. Um, for example, for an accumulated, uh, accumulated uh, one, and I will try to, to explain you uh, what this is. Give me just one second. I'm looking for an alert, okay. And as you can see, I have already some information. The, the name of the person, what type of, of uh, alert it is. It's a profiling, a KYT, meaning no year transaction. It's accumulated, and we're talking about 280,000 euros. And this is the alert. What was generated, it was an accumulated credit transaction a greater than 23,000. So this is the first one, okay? And I can see the information here, okay? I can go down and I have several alerts in, inside of the same, uh, uh, several issues inside of the same alerts. That's something different because in other systems, you every single alert, you have to be taken, it's just for one rule or for one event. 
we can here uh, um, joint and they have everything in JSON alert giving you easy way to, to, to understand. So this is just information, but you can you can see the alert summary um, when it was realized, um, opened, when it was created, uh, to who is assigned. Uh, we can have information about the account. We can see the account in a very fast way, just clicking on a, on a link, and I will open information about this account. And I have here the information. I will come to this later, uh, and I will explain you what this is. But just to see that we, to see an account, we don't have to jump from this system and go to the core banking system to, to see what's happening. We can have it here in just one click. We can see information about the entity that owns the account also. So we just click it, uh, and all the information is here. So uh, a fast way to see all the information that helps us to, to make better decisions and accurate decisions, OK? These alerts, they can be treated, uh, can be validated. I can change assignments and everything. So let me talk to you now a little bit about the top of the screen. So I have here AML risk. Uh, and if I click on it, I will see uh, how, it, how it's been changing uh, along the time. So first it was a low risk. Then it changed to a medium risk uh, in different dates. And the, all the history stays here. So you have a, just, a justification for the risk. Um, and this is what you report when, when an audit, an external audit comes and says, how many uh, low, medium, low risk clients do you have? This is what you are looking for. But the first time the client knocked on your door, you have an acceptance risk. It is, we don't know him from nowhere. We have to evaluate it. And it was evaluated as medium risk. Then he starts to make uh, transactions to 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 use the bank for his for for its own purpose, and for that we have the behavioral risk. In this case, meaning that it's a it's a private guy, and it's on cluster 15. Um, what we try to figure it out is uh, um, we can see that it changed from cluster from one cluster to another cluster, and now is on on cluster 15. Clusters is a way to find clients with the similar uh, behavior. And we are, we are going to see every single transaction that he does along the time, if it makes sense to himself and to the, 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 the cluster where, he's, where, where, he's, uh, where he belongs. Um, you can have, of course, manual risk. Manual risk is compliance officer, AML officer says, OK, I know this guy. Uh, it's a, a, um, our client for so many years. Everything is explained. Let's imagine it's a supermarket. I know that he moves a lot of money in terms of cash, but it's a supermarket. We know it. So we can down raise the risk and we can do it here. Then you have the filtering, seeing if the guy is a PEP or a sanction or whatever. It's, it's here that we see it and the diligence that is attributed to him. Okay. Uh, um, I will go now to, uh, to show you another thing that is just uh, what is this behavioral risk, what it, what it is. I have already put it here. Um, and behavioral data, it was loading, it has to load. Uh, let's see if it can load. While it's loading, I will show you other things. Uh, um, for example, another thing that I think it's really important, it's... Um, I'm having some internet problems, so it's taking too long. Give me just one second, please. Okay, it's awake. <laughs> it's awake again. Um, so I just want to show you here one thing. OK, 
Okay, back to where I was, the behavioral data. As you can see, for example, this is a matrix that is built for everything. This is not uh, um, off the shell. The model is off the shell, but it has to be built with the real data from each bank, okay? Um, and uh, uh, in this case, we have a matrix, a correlation matrix between 14 variables. In, for example, offshore credit sums, offshore debit sums, uh, high relation credit sums, and so on. Uh, that's the exchange credits and so on. This gives me the relationship, for example, between this is data for demo. Okay, don't don't look it. They, this tells me that there's a relationship. Uh, there, there exists a relation of thirty, almost thirty six percent between offshore credits and uh, all the credits that he receives. Okay, so thirty six percent of the credits comes from an offshore. That that's, this is just an example, and you can see it also in a graphic way. In this case, this one, this is the one that is uh, being shown on this graphic here. But if I click, for example, on this one, it will change. Okay, so, and the graphic will change also. As you can see it. And I can see it in 360 days, 180 days, and so on. Basically, we also have what these variables mean. And what is the account value, the average, maximum, and the standard deviation. These allow us to have a full comprehension of our customers to, to, to see... Uh, uh, if anything that he does that doesn't belong to his behavior, we should have an alert. Let's imagine, for example, that you have one client that only makes internal transactions, basically never makes an ex a transaction to, to a foreign country, and suddenly he sends to Portugal uh, $200. It's not usual for him, so it will give you an alert. It's just $200, but the question is, why is he sending $200 for, uh, um, for Portugal? Okay. Another thing that I, I want to show you, and if the search is working, is how you can see uh, um, the information about one entity. So we have all the information here, okay? We have the picture, for example. Uh, um, we have all this information. If you have documents, it would be here, contacts, filtering categories, logs, whatever everything can be shown here we can see if it has more information in this case we have a citizen card we have made an inquiry we can see the movements that this client has made okay and here i can see in the last 360 days what has been happening okay um, what currency did he use what were the operation codes what were the counterpart banks the counterpart countries which accounts he has several accounts with us and th th we have uh, money being moved from four accounts um i'm seeing in terms of quantity but i can see also in terms of amount i have an idea that he has made uh, till now 16 transactions seven or seven of them credit nine of them debit i can zoom in in a certain period of time and look deeper how things have been changing i can see it also in terms of amount for example Okay, I can always go in and zooming in. So this is uh, a, a way to have all the information of what the customer does in a just simple and easy way. Okay, uh, I can, of course, look just for currencies. I can look if they have generated alerts or didn't generate alerts. I can see all the types of operations that he has made. And I can see, uh, I can look and understand what this client does. Okay. Uh, um, we are now almost with an hour, and the only other thing that I want to show you, just for today, um, if you want to go deeper on this solution, you all, always can talk to Jive and Traversa. They are our, our partners for Nigeria, so uh, you can call them and they will arrange a more deeper uh, demo and explanation for you guys. I hope that we also will have uh, um, more... Uh, webinars when we can go deeper on on this application today it's not that that idea it's just to give an overall view um i now i just wanted to show you something that it's uh, for me really important it's the the way that we can build uh workflows because everything gets done in a very very fast way workflows are used for processes for alerts for teams uh, uh we can have different teams and as you can see it uh, uh here it's just a drag and drop way of, of doing it. Uh, um, we can see all the information inside. It's really, really easy. 
you know that what are the states that we can do uh, we can clone activate change re everything it's really easy to do another thing that Jai asked me to show you it was our engine behind this where we can build rules uh, um, and this is we call it 14 rules uh, and this is where we can build our uh, uh, rules just one second please if time I'm making a new login and I'm seeing here this is our 14 rules engine uh, where we can build new engines um, for example I will show you simple transactions so this is all the information that we can use. For example, from lists, we have uh, offshore banks, Gaffy list, OFAC, offshore, um, corresponding banks, corruption, bad countries, whatever. All the variables, this is basically what you have in your, or in your core banking system that we can use to build a, a, a rule. And then, of course, we have the rules. This is just an example. I will open one, uh, uh, for example, uh, transactions higher than 10,000 US dollars and this is how you build pure Excel it's like Excel so we say that the original currency it's dollars and the transaction amount it's bigger than 10,000 uh, and we built if we want to change it we can come here just click on it and we can uh, update it okay uh, it's not not uh, difficult to do it we also have uh, uh, other types of, uh, um, sorry. Okay, uh, what can I show you more? Um, we can uh, create, well, another thing is that we can create groups. Uh, basically, meaning that you can uh, adapt the, the, the monitoring that you do to your customers according with with your knowledge of the customers. Uh, we can define, at, at, on the limits, we could have a different uh, set of rules and models for every single account, okay? This is not feasible, but it's possible to do it. If you have the patience <laughs> to do it, it was possible to do it. Um, Okay, I think that for today I will give it leave it open to questions. I don't know, uh, Jaid, if I can. Uh... So, so thank you, Hubert, for that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Okay, good. Yes, so thank you for that. I think this is just a, um, a very first uh, kind of webinar with with uh, Dixio. I think we're very keen to uh, so to assist um, you to understand better on this on the, on the solution offering itself. Um, I don't know if there's any question that anybody wants to ask now, and but, but just type it in the in the chat. Please provide this so that we can ask them. Or should you want to ask at a later time, um, my email and USB mails there for you to um, to reach out to us. But do you have any questions now, or do you want to and to be enabled just so that you can talk? If you if you if you want to be enabled to talk, may I suggest you raise your hand. I think there's a functionality there to support that. Promise, can you see that? Is there somebody raised their hand or their hand to a question or something? No, okay. Is somebody, okay. No questions from anybody for now, is that correct? No, okay. So, so thank you all. I think we, we, we've taken more than you know, for this, the, an hour that we promised. Um, but so thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, we hope you found it very, very useful. Um, should you wish to reach us, as I said before, our emails are provided and you can also reach us through our phone numbers as well, right on the site. So please feel free to get in touch with us. And thank you and have a very good day. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye.